Hello, and welcome to the Bitcoin Dot Review podcast. This is an ad free pod. Thank you so much for streaming those ads. If you're a new listener, I'm NVK and I run CoinKite, where we've been helping people secure their Bitcoins for over a decade. We make products like the Code Card, the Block Clock, and we have a bunch of other projects. You can find more information on coinkite.com. Today we have a, a, an absolute all star panel here. We're going to be talking about the uh, Bitcoin Op Vault, it's uh, a new proposal by James. And, um, you know, like uh, any new proposals to Bitcoin, there is there is a lot to, to go over. And uh, it's it's a very big, interesting topic. So today we have uh, Rindel. Hey, good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm here talking about vaults, uh, Bitcoin developer, and I work a lot on multi-sig and vaults that don't use covenants. So really interested to talk about this uh, this proposal. Very cool. We have uh, Ben De Carmen, return guest. Hey, uh, thanks for having me on again. Um, I'm guessing I'm here because I posted to the analyst about how you could do like the CTV optimization with uh, um, C or for DLCs. You can optimize them with covenants, and I showed how you could do it with the op vaults as well. Great, Antoine. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Antoine Ponceau. Um, I've been working in building an actual vault architecture, which does not use Covenant for the past two year and a half. Uh, lately, I've been working on other projects, but I guess that, that's why I'm here. And the man of the hour, James O'Byrne. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm a Bitcoin developer. I spend a lot of my days working on core, but for the last few years, um, I've been really interested in custody systems uh, and the promise of vaults. Um, and last year, I actually implemented a similar vault design on top of uh, OpCTV, which I'm sure we've covered at some point on the show, maybe. But, um, you know, I was kind of dissatisfied with those implementations for various reasons. And so I decided to, to come up with this proposal. So um, just want to say that, you know, I mean, to make this a, a lively discussion, uh, you should do your best to, you know, rip into this and you won't offend me, you know, kind of regardless of whatever you say, you know, like NVK said, uh, any new proposal for Bitcoin has to be kind of shredded apart and scrutinized. So totally uh, ready and welcoming of that. Now, this is going to be great. So, guys, th there is a lot of confusion because there's a lot of stuff going on in terms of uh, the Bitcoin Twitter drama and, and Bitcoin list. I think a lot of people like me had the list muted <laughs> for a few months due to, you know, tail emissions, RBF. Like, you know, there's been a lot of stuff that happened in the last few months. So I kind of got the the vibe that a lot of people like kind of missed up vault. Uh, the, some of the discussions that happened because it was kind of like lost in the noise and also sort of like confuses it with like, you know, the ordinals and all this other stuff. Like we just posted some questions this morning on Twitter and people were sort of like talking about ordinals. So let's just sort of like box in. Like, so what is up vault? Like, like the, the elevator pitch first, just so we can get people to just sort of get it. Yeah. So I guess I, I can feel this one um, to be really brief. Op vaults basically just a really practical, low overhead way of introducing this way that you can lock up your coins in such a way that that if you want to spend those coins, you have to navigate through this delay period. You have to wait for the, the coins to kind of settle, aside from the fact that you can sweep it at any time before that final withdrawal to a pre-specified what I call recovery path. So the idea is, you know, you can set up your coins to have some ultra secure, uh, you know, totally impractical, completely offline recovery wallet. Or you could even do something kind of interesting, like have, you know, a social recovery type thing where, you know, uh, your friends hold keys and maybe you need like three out of five friends signatures to actually recover the coins or something. So basically it just gives you a way of introducing um, you know, key storage or a fallback mechanism that like isn't really practical for day-to-day -day use. But in the worst case, if your coins are going to be stolen, you can kind of invoke. Would you say like very simplistically, that's kind of like having a wallet in the blockchain? 
you know, like people, you know, deposit funds to this wallet in the actual chain. Uh, and then there is this sort of, you know, they gave a bad name to it, but a smart contract that, uh, you know, has some conditions. And then, you know, if these conditions are met or change, like something else happens, right? So like you kind of have like an if and else sort of like if this, then that kind of thing on, on the chain on your wallet, right? So I'll give a very brief example. Say, for example... I put the coins in this script, right? This op vault that uses op vault that says, you know, you can only spend, you know, one BTC per block. And if you try to do more, I'm going to send the coins to this other address, right? That is like a recovery. So for example, if somebody tries to send more, the, the coins are going to simply go somewhere else, right? That's kind of like how you take your money back in case it gets uh, stolen. Would you say that that's correct or that's sort of like pushing a little too far on what's possible? Uh, it looks like Reindell wants to talk. So well, yeah, I was going to say like, or, or the other motivating example that I use a lot is, you know, I think a lot of people will have some really what they hope is secure long term storage for their Bitcoin. So they've got maybe like a multi sig setup or they've got some hardware wallet that's, you know, buried under the well. And they want to be able to periodically take coins out of it and move it either to a hot wallet for spending or maybe they have to send it to an exchange to sell or whatever. And for for a lot of people, I think the nightmare scenario is, you know, oh, God, what if my house gets burglarized and somebody like takes my wallet? Can they now just steal all of my money? So a really great capability to have would be to say, um, you know, I've got a whitelisted set of places that I, I expect to be sending my coins. You know, I might send it to my phone wallet. I might send it to an exchange. If it goes to any of those, it's OK. I'm going to let it happen. But if somebody breaks into my house, steals my my hardware wallet and tries to sweep my funds, then I have some big red button that I can push and sweep it somewhere else. And maybe that somewhere else is like a crazy five of nine multi-sig. Maybe I'm going to sweep it to my Aunt Betsy's wallet. Like whatever makes sense to me, it's a way to have kind of like a holding period on the withdrawal of my coins. And during that holding period, I can kind of revoke that action. I think that that's generally what vaults give you. And I'm sure we're going to talk about how you can scale that up to more sophisticated kind of institutional setups like what folks at Revault are doing. Or you can scale that down to just I'm a, a you know single hodler. I've got my stash in cold storage and I just want to have really good security for when I take my money out. So how does the blockchain know? What's going on? How, how does, you know, because, you know, this is not like we have a Turing complete between quotes blockchain contract system here, right? So, so how does it know? Like, how does your script know that somebody tried to do something? Uh, and what, how does it know what to do next? And how does that get triggered? Yeah, so NVK, to get back to the, the example you brought up earlier, which is this idea of kind of like thresholding uh, some kind of transfer rate. I just want to be clear that OpVault doesn't actually um, get into specifying things like thresholds because that gets really, really complicated. And Antoine can probably talk about that because Revault, you know, is is a way of basically enabling um, very fine grained uh, thresholding and, and spending conditions kind of at a higher layer with, with multi-sig. Now, Revault could probably make use of uh, Op Vault almost certainly. And actually, if you wanted to do the scheme that you were talking about where you're thresholding you know, some some transfer amount, you know, sort of per block. It's possible you could you could like tranche up your coins in, into different op vault invocations, but I'm not as sure about that. Um, but op vault it is is a much more kind of simple mechanism than than yeah, specimen threshold. Maybe yeah, maybe maybe something that might help explain op vault is maybe we can spend a few minutes talking about how you would do a system like this today with just like multi-sig and ephemeral keys and pre-signed transactions. Because all of these use cases that we're talking about, you could actually do today, but there's some real trade-offs in terms of like liveliness, availability, and security of funds. And I think what James's op vault proposal does, or NVK, if I can say the C word on your show, what other covenant proposals enable is letting you get rid of some of those, those trade-offs by having consensus rules encoded. The problem with the whole ephemeral key thing and the whole like Brian Bishop's like vaults and things that he was yep. creating, I forgot the name of that that uh, that proposal. It, it, is that like you know it was just sort of like a, 
a, a theoretical idea, right? Nobody is going to do that realistically because, you, you know, you can't prove that the keys were deleted even for yourself. You can't. That, yep. that, that was what I, I think I talked to him about that in, uh, what was it, in a Miami meetup uh, during the conference last time. And, and I don't think, like, most people even know about that, aside mm -hmm. from people who are, like, very close to core work. So, like, maybe we can touch up on it, but, like, I... I not sure if there is much value in sort of like expanding too much on that. Why don't you give us like some some examples of of what he could do right now? Like give us some practical stuff. Like as a as a 30 second kind of overview of how you could do vaults today, there are really like two techniques. Number one is to generate these temporary keys and basically um, use those keys to sign, you know, a number of transactions that spend coins in certain ways and then you delete those keys, and so after you've sent the coins into those transactions that are controlled by the keys that you just deleted, they're basically locked into a covenant structure. The other thing that you can do is kind of like the way that Revault works, where you have sort of a big array, like a big multi-sig setup, and some of those keys are controlled by computers that will just kind of auto-sign on the basis of certain conditions. And you know, so I think in the in the pre-signed transaction ephemeral key thing, it's tricky because, like you say, key deletion is really tough. And you have to kind of like, you're locked into all the parameters that you choose when you're creating the vault, like what key it's gonna get transferred to, you know, what amount, uh, who's managing the fees. Um, and you have to keep track of all that transaction information. And then if you're gonna go with the more like sort of flexible revault implementation, you know, there's a big infrastructure burden, or I mean, bigger infrastructure burden in terms of like running uh, all those auto signers and making sure everything's online and available and all that. And also the introduction of new assumptions with regards to having present transactions, because uh, if you are running, let's say, a network monitor or watchtower, as it's called in, uh, in Lightning World, that would enforce your sp your spending policies. Uh, let's say, say with Revolt, basically, you have a large multisig and you are delegating funds to a lower multisig. So the covenant, let's say, is enforced by the fact that the lower threshold multisig does not have access to the keys of the end of end that is as a as root. So they are stuck with using an involved transactions. That uh, is basically what enforced unchain uh, with an open vault in more complex ways because then you have multiple keys. And uh, to this involved is presigned to cancel transactions. And so the involved uh, basically is sends the coins either immediately to a transaction that is a clawback to, to the initial end of N, or after a delay to some funds managers that can then uh, use them. In the meantime, uh, a spending policy can be enforced as by just broadcasting the cancel transaction. And it comes back to your initial question about how this uh, spending policies can be enforced on the blockchain. The answer is that we don't. We just let a delay with the present transaction or a covenant uh, well, we can enforce basically any any spending policy, whether it is a 2FA, whether it is a, a limited uh, amount that can be spent per day, a whitelist, uh, anything. And what's very limiting with using pre-signed transactions here is that you need to know that all your watchtowers that are enforcing your policies get your pre-signed transactions before you actually sign the unvault transaction, before you actually commit to being able to get the funds out of the vault. You need to know that you are going to have a way to, to get them back with the cancelled transactions. And usually uh, in Bitcoin, we assume, and especially with these sums, uh, we assume that the laptop is compromised. But basically with pre-signed transactions, you would store them on computers and had servers and you would not be able to it's stateful so you would not be able to check on your uh, signing device and only have the signing device as a rate of trust uh, that you can always uh, get back your funds whereas if it's encoded in a covenant you can check it on your signing device yeah. I, I mean all computers are compromised like i mean we're we're past that point now and and the incentives are to become further compromised by even more actors compromising them, right? Because now the money is in the computer and more people have the money in their computers. So let's say that we have OpVault gets in, right? And and also anchors so that we can like change fees because you can't realistically have up vaults without having a way to changing fees or adding more So fees. what's cool now, I, I have yet to announce this on the mailing list, but um, 
I've actually figured out a way to avoid the reliance on um, V3 and anchors and all that stuff. So like, well, that's amazing. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that is really cool. Do you, you want to give us like a, a, a quick brief on that? Yeah, 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 sure. So, so basically in Opvault, you have to make a decision about whether your recovery path is authenticated or not. And what I mean by that is so when you create the vault, you have to declare like where the funds can be recovered to. In Op Vault, you can optionally specify an additional script that has to be satisfied to even trigger that recovery. And so the reason originally that we needed anchors for fee management in Op Vault was um, if, if you're doing what I call an unauthenticated recovery, which is, is basically just like if someone knows your recovery path, the way that Op Vault works is when you create the vault, you hash the recovery path and then you add that as a parameter. So basically like the ability to recover is correlated with the ability to um, reveal that, that pre-image. So if you do that, you can sweep. Um, so it's sort of like you're not, to get really technical, you're not signing it with sig hash all. And so there's some like pinning problems that can happen. But what I found was that um, if you actually require, you know, um, an authorization for the recovery, if you choose, you know, some key, it could be based on like sort of a, you know, passphrase you memorize or, a, you know, a wallet that sits in your closet. It's OK if it gets lost, actually. But if you use that that key, then you can basically roll in unrelated inputs and outputs to both the recovery and to the unvault transaction. And so you can use that as your fee management mechanism. When you're actually doing the recovery or the unvaulting, you can roll in unrelated coins. Or you can rely on you know, the ephemeral anchor approach. So you, you have a lot of, you have even more flexibility about how fee management works. So with, with like a, I'm not saying there's a good idea or a bad idea, right? I, just like as, as an illustrative example. It's a safe space. This is a safe space. Right, yeah, yeah, for sure. Safe space for bad key management. So um, if I wanted to have like a hot wallet on my phone that held the keys to authorize the recovery path, it sounds like a thing that I could do is keep a couple bucks in that wallet. And then if I ever have to hit the big red button on my phone, I can use those little bit of funds to pay the fee for my recovery sweep. Is that kind of the idea for whatever your choice of thing on your phone is? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. And, um, you know, the, so, like, oh, go ahead, MVK. Yeah, so, so like how... How would you practically do that? Say like, you know, because the, the vault might be 10 year sort of plan here, right? Like if people are doing this, they're thinking like, you know, they're kids, right? Yeah. Like, uh, so, so like, I guess like, you know, you leave your key, like a key to a, a safe deposit box that has like, you know, say, you know, 1%, 5% of your stash in it. That is just sort of like the backup plan to handle things because you don't know relative to your transaction how much that may cost in 20, 50 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it could actually mm -hmm. be a lot more than 5-10% of the actual stash itself, uh, depending on how the UTXO set is, right? So just just curious, like how, how do you sort of like see that? Yeah, so it's it's tricky to think about, right? Because, you know, I think people rightfully raise the point that if in your fee management strategy you need to rely on actually having other coins available that aren't that aren't vaulted. That's a reasonable objection to me, but at at the same time, you know, I think there are definitely plausible schemes where, you know, you've still got value locked up in that vault. And so it's very easy to do this kind of atomic swap type thing where someone offers to fund your unvault on the basis of you presenting them with an unvault that pays them out, you know, some amount. Right, I can see that as a service. Right. And, and I think like that's, that's not like an objection per se. I think this is more uh, uh, like just trying to work out the kinks through, right? right. Because it's, it's sort of like a, we're going to have to rethink, right? Like, and I'm speaking as somebody who's, who does the hardware wallets, right? Like I'm going to have to rethink of like, how do I advise the users on how they do their setups and how do they mm -hmm. use the how do they, they how do they do key management right because mm -hmm. that's all going to change uh, right. and this is actually fantastic right because multi sig is a shit coin yeah. <laughs> uh, so okay so you know like we have a way now to to handle the fees maybe it's, there is an op vault for the op vault right like maybe there is a simpler op vault that like you built that just handles fees in case you need 
more fees, right? That's like your fee wallet. Well, and, and the other thing that's, yeah, go ahead. The other thing that's like really nice about OpVault as opposed to other vaulting schemes that rely on pre-signed transactions is that you don't have to pre-bake them, right? So if you're like DCAing into your savings every month or something, you can then have one unvault or you know a few and then a series of recovery transactions. So that makes the fee management in the future more flexible than if every time you deposit into your savings, you have to pre-bake a transaction and now you have hundreds of these things and you have to worry about how do I do fee bumping across you know this, this set of hundreds of pre-signed transactions from the 20 years that I was DCAing or something. How, how uh, practically speaking would a user get a list of addresses or generate new addresses to deposit on a vault? Yeah, so you have a lot of choices there. And this is kind of where I need to spend a lot, I mean, I, we need to spend a lot of time thinking about like what kind of the recommended usage patterns are, because let me describe to you like all the variability that you have in terms of what goes into an op vault address, right? So in simple terms, when you lock up coins in a vault, you're creating a pay to taproot transaction to a taproot script that um, looks like op vault. And then the first param is the hash of your recovery path with that optional authorization key. Second parameter is the spend delay. And the third parameter is the hash of the key that you use to actually trigger the unvault process. So that's what goes into the script. But because this is taproot, right, we can choose an internal key to use. So you can either choose a, a nums point so that like the vault is the only spendable way. What I prefer to do is actually use an XPUB that's associated with your super, super cold path, your recovery path. And, you know, obviously there, like, you can either vary the XPUB along that, just um, along that descriptor, you can keep the XPUB stat, you can keep the, uh, the internal key static, you can vary the recovery path along a descriptor. So, like, really, you can mask the fact that you're using, um, that you have, like, a number of different coins and addresses that are all actually controlled by the same key material or you can just reuse an address and this is so, good uh huh so so like let's say we're doing this deterministically right cuz that's the best way to generate addresses like yep. you know and, and you don't want to dox the the pile right so you know i'm 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 generating addresses there right and i'm depositing to new ones because i have this xpub somewhere so if i understand correctly uh, when i'm generating a transaction to unvault some of those utxos Right, it would look very similar to a standard wallet, right? I mean, I pick those UTXOs, and uh, this wallet understands the you know the the parent script there, and uh, and sort of like say, hey, I want to spend this, and if the key matches, then then you start the process, right? Would that would that be correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, the only thing that gives you away in terms of that you're 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 using a vault or doing an unvault is that you have to present certain data on the witness stack when you're actually spending the vault. Because like, like with any kind of taproot script spend, you've got to present essentially the, the path, you know, and um, there are certain, like I think the, the shape of the data that you're putting into the witness um, is going to be pretty readily identifiable as being a vault thing. But to me, I don't know, that's, that's, that's not I don't see that as an issue. Mm -hmm. It's more a concern about, you know, people being able to link the UTXOs to the vault. Oh right. yeah, and, and yeah, they no. Can't. So they can't. They can't. Exactly. This yeah. is beautiful that way. Yeah. So let's say we get it in, right? Like somehow we get it into Bitcoin, right? Somehow. Yeah, somehow. Uh, which we're gonna we should get into a little bit too because I think it's important. You know, we get it in. What do you think would be sort of like the first so low hanging fruit? sort of like scenarios that people are going to start building that are sort of like less complicated and sort of like mm -hmm. more accessible to, to wallet developers, right? They may not fully comprehend that, like how far this mm -hmm. thing can go. So like what are the first few case scenarios you see that the people could sort of like start using very fast? Yeah. That would be also safe. And I know I'll have to hand it off to Reindahl uh, to cover because I, I know he's got some, but I, I do have a few. Number one is like the brain dead improvement to security that everybody could make at pretty much minimal effort, which is basically just introduce, like use OpVault and have your recovery path be um, a sort of separate hardware manufacturer kind of wallet technique than you have right now. Even if it's as stupid as like some 
software wallet that you spun up on a computer one time, as long as it's not correlated with the way that you store your coins right now, there's essentially no cost. I mean, the cost that you pay is like a slight delay to spend your coins, but there's there's no cost to introducing kind of an uncorrelated path to do to do recovery. So really anybody could do that. The second pretty easy scenario to set up, which I think is pretty cool, is if you're worried about like a hostage situation, you can actually, and, and really, I mean, Obvault is kind of uniquely allows you to do this. You can set up a configuration where let's say that your spend delay is a week and let's say that your recovery path points to a taproot script, which is only spendable after you know a month. You can have a situation where you can prove to your attacker, hey, look, I like I can't touch these coins even if you start the process moving. We can't touch this for at least another week. So you know that secondary receiving script, right? Would that be based on where is the private key for that? You're talking about the recovery path. That's right. Yeah. So you know that's up to you, kind of however you want to store that, whether it's in your backyard, safety deposit box. You want to store it in such a way that it's not readily accessible. You know, I think online it's because if, if somebody gets your recovery key and they figure out your recovery key where your vaults are and the sort of recovery parameters that you use they can trigger a sweep to your recovery wallet yeah i mean they have access to the nuclear codes yeah let's put it this way right yeah so would you would you say that you know with with a few years of this in the market and sort of like people sort of really making this safe let's put it this way right would you say that maybe you don't have a nuclear code anymore? Like you, 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 you know, like you kind of go the path of the ephemeral keys, right? To generate all these paths. And then they just sort of like keep on rolling, right? And your family has been the owners of this vault for the last 100 years and things just keep on rolling and moving and rolling and moving. And maybe you have a key ceremony every 20 years where, you know, you give the, you know, you do a key shuffle, for example, a provable key shuffle where nobody essentially knows uh, what, what the keys really are and it's provable and you do it on camera or whatever. And then uh, the family sort of wealth continues, right? Like into this sort of rolling vault. Is this something that you sort of like imagine or, or you're thinking more sort of like today, nuclear cold kind of thing? Or it's maybe unsafe to do that. I don't know. I can imagine that. I mean, you can certainly facilitate the transfer of a vault pretty securely based on the spend delay. So if you and your family decide, you know, you want to set up different security parameters, different key configuration, obviously like Taproot gives you a lot of flexibility in that recovery path. So you can set up all kinds of spending conditions there. In terms of like doing key delegation and renegotiating, you know, which keys can sign, that's, are, are you, uh, Reindell, are you uh, unmuting this? Well, yeah, I was going to say, like, the other cool thing about this being Taproot is since we have sh uh, Schnorr signatures, we can do things like proactive secret sharing. So, like, with Frost, which is a threshold signing scheme for uh, Schnorr signatures, you can do things like you can change the quorum size of the, the signing set or you can change the composition of the signing set without actually doing an on-chain transaction. So if over time you wanted to change your, you know, primary vault key from being a three of five to a 10 of 15 or whatever, because you've amassed generational wealth in your vault, like you could do that without actually needing to reconfigure your vault. So like that, there's a lot of moving pieces there, but um, because this is built on Tapper, there's these kind of orthogonal key management gains that we're going to have that I think are, you know, additive for, for vaults. You know, if we just sort of like use the imagination, right? The idea mm -hmm. is like, you know, I no longer need to make hardware wallets, right? Like, no, seriously, it's like, you know, I, I make a device that is a safe device for you to construct the transactions outside mm -hmm. of computers, right? Or construct the scripts outside of computers. And, you know, like you're in your starship going somewhere else and the vault just exists, right? In chain and you just continue sort of like rolling and nobody needs to touch it. And, you know, it doles out funds based on your trusts, uh, like actual trust uh, rules, right? And you have trustee keys and, and you can really sort of like represent the trust rules, for example, on, on a script, right? It really is not that hard so that you're complying with the law. And, and like, it, it's quite amazing when you, when you sort of really extend this out. I know it's like, there's a lot of moving parts and things, but I, I get excited about that because seeing users <laughs> have 
you know, single sig plus passphrase being way more sane than like cool multi sig stuff that you can do, and people lose money with that. You know, I, I think that what we have is amazing. It's an incredible like upgrade from fiat and from gold vaults and things like that, but it's completely unsustainable. Like I cannot see, you know, like a billion, two billion people, you know, with like harder wallets that, that look like the ones we make, you know, maybe the cards, but like even then it's like there is a limit to this, right? Uh, and most people also won't have enough money or wealth that will, that will be worth the device. And, you know, we can make sort of like poor people's vaults, <laughs> right? Like, you know, like, uh, and, and like a, a person doesn't have to have a lot of like money to be able to, to have a solution that's like, it's like here, you spin this script and like, you know, your the, the little savings you have sort of go into this and, and, and these things are all done for you. Uh, and they're all very safe and simplified. Uh, at least like this is how I, I see this stuff playing out. Well, it also kind of expands the design space of where you can have trust minimized third parties that can help you with management without actually delegating spend authority to them, right? So James was talking about this hostage situation a minute ago. You know, imagine a scenario where you're like a high net worth person or even masked your, your giant stack of Bitcoin. And so you have some company that you say like, hey, look, if, if you see movement out of my vault and I'm not present in your office with all of my family, then push this button and it'll trigger my emergency spend path, right? And like, boom, that, that's how you deal with somebody, you know, kidnapping your kids and using it to like extort your money out of you. Like that, that's a way that you can delegate some very, very, very specific spend path execution to a third party without them actually being able to spend all of your money. There, there's lots of really interesting use cases in that direction. Right now, there is people out there that have an envelope sealed mm -hmm. in their lawyer's hand with their private keys. 100%. I, I yeah. mean, and it's not a non-trivial number. He, well, I mean, the, 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 reason why, the reason why I started talking to James about this is, um, you know, I think that a really underappreciated use case of vaults is for inheritance planning, yeah. right? Like everybody has this problem of I want to make sure that either my kids or my wife or whomever can get to my Bitcoin if I get hit by a bus. But I also don't want to have like a spat with my wife and then she runs away with all my Bitcoin. Or I don't want my kids to decide that they want a new car and they like go upstairs into the family firebox and like steal all the Bitcoin. So it'd be really great if I could give my kids or my heirs or whomever some easy way to get to my Bitcoin, but there's time as an additional sort of authentication factor. And if I look at my phone and it says that my inheritance path has been activated and I'm still alive, then I can push a button and, and sweep those funds back. I think that kind of thing is, is maybe a really killer app for Bitcoin self-custody because you can't do that with other bearer assets. And um, being able to do that at an individual level without a bunch of extra infrastructure is really appealing. You can do that in Bitcoin today. So. How would that work? You just receive to a script with a CSV, maybe of one Yeah, year. for sure. So, uh, of course, with Covenants, it would make that easier because then you can have a trigger transaction and so you don't have to rotate your coins. But mm -hmm. uh, you, you, this inheritance thing, you can you can already do something like that in Bitcoin. Yeah, so like you can do that with CSV today, but then you end up with the problem of, you know, I set a two-year, you know, relative time lock on my coins and now every year and 11 months, I have to like go yeah. and rotate my UTXOs in order to reset the timer. You know, it feels unsafe. It feels that everything that we have for this purpose without something like proper covenants on chain is not like possible for most people, right? Like you, you, you're definitely going to have something like Revolt, you know, where, mm -hmm. you know, institutions are going to go and they're going to have people audit the script and audit the paths and sort of like, you know, like go through the, but, but it, it, it's going to be very hard and it feels unsafe. I mean, like when people are talking about their money, it cannot, if it feels unsafe, right? Like multi-sig feels unsafe, right? Like people won't use it. Right. This is the beauty of passphrase with with single sig. Right. Like it feels safe. Yeah. Right? And, and then well, it, it's, it's so simple. Right. Like there, there's is. not many moving parts. I mean, like the amount of people who lost money on the most secure system that there was at the time, which was Armory. Remember Armory Wallet? Yeah. Like I know so many people whose coins got locked, and that's it. <laughs> like you know. This is the issue with all this complex, amazing setups is that like you end up screwing yourself out of your coins, which is the majority of the people. 
Well, and, and, and I, I think we're seeing market demand for that, right? Because like when the multi-sig descriptor was added for Taproot in Bitcoin Core, like the first thing that everybody did with it was time decaying multi-sig because people want the security of multi-sig, but they also really want to make sure that they can get to their money. So they say, okay, cool. In two years, it's going to decay from a three of five to a one of two or something. But then you have this problem of like, okay, I've got a ticking clock until my coins become less secure. So now I have to have a reminder on my phone every two years. To yeah, like, but then you get hit by a bus and, yeah, and right. then your wife didn't know. And now you yeah. went to another wallet that they had no idea, right? Like we yeah. see this all the time. Like, you know, the, the clever programmer husband, you know, goes and creates like, you know, a shadowy super coder, amazing script and amazing setup on their, you know, like vintage, you know, 93 IBM uh, laptop, right? And with, you know, with Cubes OS and, you know, and, and then like, great, so cool. Well, one, he probably gets pissed off one day and accidentally like attaches a USB stick and boom, money gone, right? Because he was just not thinking that day. And then the other one is... uh you know, again, guy passes, right? Or get gets like, you know, brain doesn't work anymore. And uh, that's it. Like family can't recover. Like it, it just happens a lot. Yeah, I, I don't see how it's, it relates though, to having a time like recovery key. I, I mean, it's just a straight improvement to the situations that you described with the envelope, uh, having to share your public key for inheritance. You just have a second public key that is time locked and you just share this one. So... At worst case, you don't rotate your coins within years and, well, you're probably dead, but if you're not and just you forget for years to not rotate your coins, then the lawyer can access your coins and it's the same situation as today. So, yeah. well, yeah, I think the challenge is, is sort of this thing of, um, I, I think there's been enough education in the Bitcoin ecosystem about like, hey, you really need to have your seed backed up. But I think when you start getting into like more interesting scripts and more interesting spend paths, people are less sure about how do I back up my descriptors or whatever other metadata I need to actually spend those coins. And so, um, you know, there, there's a lot of just, you know, people are figuring out new places to hide a piece of metal with seed words stamped on them. We, we haven't really gotten to that level of creativity for what do I do with my descriptor. Like, I, I haven't seen somebody, you know, tattoo their blood type and their descriptor, like, on their, you know, butt cheek yet. But I'm sure it's coming. And I think that, you know, how, how, we, how we back up that metadata is a super important question. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the things, like, I absolutely hate is uh, Shamir's secret sharing for key yeah. backup, right? Because yeah. it's like reinventing multisig with a complex script that's completely custom, right? Yeah. And it's like vendor specific and it's not Bitcoin related, right? So like, I'm like, okay, if you're going to do this, then use multisig, at least it's Bitcoin, right? Uh, and, and there is more sort of like, you know, greater sort of education and adoption. So, so that was the motivation to create CDXR, right? Like mm. we, we still needed a way for people to split uh, uh, their their main root keys, right? But we wanted a way that, like you know, like a donkey could recover with pen and paper, and just sort of like every time we we start thinking about practical sort of like security, we try to like go back to like World War Two, right? And, and like seriously, like this is how we think about this stuff. And it's like, okay, I am a guy, you know, like trying to flee some. Psh- some country that's in war and like computers yeah. are not available or compromised, right? Like I need to take my money with me, right? Like, and I have to go naked, right? Like h- how do you actually like go through that process, right? Like based on this complex stuff and, and, and sort of like that kind of leads me to like, you know, the further picking and risks that I'm trying to sort of like think through on, on op vault or the practical ones. I, I think we, we can still like sort of go through a little bit more of the technical stuff in terms of like the actual like interesting parts of how this works. But the the practical stuff, you know, needs a lot of thought still, right? Like how do you manage this, this keys? How do you manage the nuclear codes? You know, do you do an op vault, an op vault, an op vault? So like you have some recursive way of like, you know, moving stuff around. Um, you know, how would wallet UXs address the vaults and create all this stuff and, you know... What kinds of like things you guys have like sort of fought through in this sort of practical space? I think that's a lot of the work that remains to be done. I mean, I, I think the framework right now gives the end user a, a lot of configurability. And in designing it, I'm, I'm trying to avoid any 
particular configuration that would be like just blatantly unsafe and you know like any any use that just wouldn't make any sense but at the same time you know i mean things like for your recovery path are you using a static address there or are you varying it over a descriptor you know like that that does have mm -hmm. implications is your optional recovery off parameter is that derived from maybe the descriptor of your cold wallet or is that a, a separate key that that have has its own life cycle and is independent all these choices do have um, implications and i think we're really going to have to spend the next year few years like kind of figuring out you know what the what the right usages are and like really nailing those but you know, my concern that it, it, you have to balance kind of like getting the usages exactly right with like the fact that right now custody for everybody is nerve wracking. It's totally nerve wracking. Like Jameson Lop has this great article where he talks about vaults, a little bit about the history, a little bit about op vault. And he, he introduces this framework for thinking about things, which is like right now we have proactive security, which is like, you do your best to build your fortress, like set up your keys in the right way. But, you know, like, I mean, notable developers, right, uh, have been compromised. And, and it's probably likely that they went to great lengths to, to do this proactive security and build this wonderful fortress that like fell down. You know, something like Opvault gives you uh, like reactive security where you can see, okay, like I've been compromised, an attack is happening, what can I do about it? How am I gonna respond? You know, and so Opvault's really the first on-chain mechanism for doing something like that. And I, I think we have an acute need for it, especially at the corporate level. Like, look, I mean, individuals holding Bitcoin is, is my favorite and most important use case, but like we all like that MicroStrategy holds a lot of Bitcoin. You know, one plausible argument for like a better future is for someone like America, you know, to hold Bitcoin as a reserve in their central bank to do things like that. Like you need an ironclad sort of like nuclear level strategy. It lowers insurance. See, yeah. see, this is the thing, right? Like when, you, when yeah. you're talking about institutions, right? I mean, institutions don't have the luxury of like choices, like of many choices or, or like, uh, you know, how they feel about stuff. You know, like you have like legal frameworks, right, for custody of things as a public trader company or whatever, right? And and then you have your charter, like, and then you have all your fiduciary sort of like nuances of things. And, you know, you're going to have to follow this very sort of traditional ways on how things are, are custodied. And then they might de-risk it by using different vendors as well. So splitting the pile. And then everything needs to be insured. And often you have insurance of the insurance as well, especially because, you know, if you're, you're trying to, and, and it's in dollars for the next foreseeable near future here, at least, you know, this is denominated in dollars. So you have to get reinsured as the price of Bitcoin goes up and down. And, uh, you know, they're going to try to understand your vault, your security, you know, like that's why you use custodians. They already have like a lot of like, you know, provable experience on what they've done, like Fidelity or Coinbase or whatever. And you know it costs a lot. The insurance on this stuff is is, is obnoxious, right? Because this is a, a very easy to steal asset, right? Like its best feature is its sellability and and you know fungibility and, and transportability, right? So how do you do that cheaper, which everybody cares about, and safer, right? And and I think like this is this is great for enterprise that has to deal with insurance. And soon enough, we're gonna see like even individuals seeking insurance, right? That's what the guys from like Anchor Watch and things like that are trying to do. But it's hard because you can't prove that you lost a key. You can't prove that it was a not a bolt accident. It's very tricky. You know, like say the cops break into your house uh, because somebody did a swatting on you and they open your safe and they took a look at the keys. Now the money disappears a month later. How do you prove that the law did it, right? I mean, look at the Silk Road problem, right? <laughs> I mean, all the cops involved in taking down the Silk Road magically became millionaires, right? So, so anyways, like th this stuff really sort of facilitates this, this next stage of the Bitcoin future, at least in my view. That's why I'm so excited about this. Now, I, I think we can do like a lot more complex stuff. And, and uh, I, you know, that's why I brought Ben here. Ben is interested in, uh, in the shitcoining layer of Bitcoin. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he's going to talk a little bit about DLCs and, and like lightning stuff and all the things that we could maybe do with, uh, with OpVault as, uh, as another primitive in Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, to preface it, like, we probably, if we want to do all this stuff, we probably don't want to opt vault for it. We should use, like, CTV or APO or, like, 
or any things that are like more custom tailored for it. Like the way you do it without belts, kind of a hack. Um, but basically, like you know, we want these primitives where, um, like today with like Bitcoin script, you can't really say like it has to be spent. Like it's only like locking it under like these conditions. It can't. You're not saying like it must be spent with this amount or to this address and anything like that. So you can't have like any guarantees in your address that like it's going to be spent to the right person, just by the right person. And because of that, like you know, say like you have an address with one Bitcoin in, it and you say I want it to be split like seventy five percent to me, you know, twenty five percent to James. The only way to do that is just like me and James have a multi sig and agree to sign that correctly. Mm-hmm. Versus like with not Vault, you can have that or like CTV or any of those. We can have it like enforced in the script that, um, you know, 75% would go to me and 25% to James. So with that like kind of primitive, you can build a lot of like really cool stuff where, I um, mean, the, the one I pointed out was DLCs where, I mean, Lloyd Funny pointed out originally and I showed you could do it with vaults where you could, um, instead of like having a DLC with like a 10,000 pre-signed transactions, you just have a single address that's encoded inside the address is your entire DLC contracts so you can kind of create these like really fancy stuff all inside of a single address and um and it, the cool thing is too you can make these like extremely composable where like say your dlc payout address is just like another dlc or like you know maybe as a instead of like being an individual in a dlc you have it as like a company so then say like i win the dlc and then the payout it goes like nine percent to me and then ten percent to my investors or something so you can kind of like build these structures really easily where like all these fancy things are happening all in force and bitcoin script instead of like hoping your multi-sig um, game theory works out yeah like the way that i've been trying to generalize this is a lot of times the w- if you want to do interesting smart contracting with Bitcoin, what that usually ends up looking like is trading around a lot of transactions for people to sign and then trade back. And what's really cool about covenants and, you know, I I think like a really simple generalization of covenants is that Bitcoin script right now lets you put conditions on the inputs of a transaction. Covenants let you put conditions on the outputs of a transaction. And so if you have some covenant system, then you can take all of like the network IO and the coordination of signing in in contracting protocols, and you can reduce it down to um, like signature generation. So like locally, I generate a giant Merkle tree of all the possible conditions and I sign it and we just have to trade around Merkle commitments. And that's a lot cheaper from a coordination perspective than like we have to actually pass all of these things around. And that's really important for DLCs. I think it's also important for things like coin pools or or channel factories or other like multi-party constructions. Yeah. So let's talk about some sort of like uh, like examples that like a person who, who does not understand this technically sort of like would get. Like what, what things could we see here? Because now that you have the DLCs, you know, with proper chain control, right? you you can do a lot right i mean you can you can create financialization things products you can you can do like batting things you can do there's really like a, a very big sort of like new space of things you can do so maybe uh, ben you know could you talk about i know this is kind of controversial but for me this is one of the most exciting things is this idea of doing uh, endogenous usd stable coins with DLCs where you don't have to have some entity that's like holding dollars in a bank account. You can synthesize USD exposure with Bitcoin. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to bring up. Like, I think the biggest um, use case most likely for DLCs is either degenerate gambling of like sports betting or, you know, or other other likely is, uh, you know, creating stable coins without like having like, you know, Tether, which just has a bank account somewhere and you hope it's there. And a stable coin, a synthetic stable coin is degenerate gambling on the price of Bitcoin. So it's all degenerate gambling. It's a a directional trade. This is the problem. for sure. Both legs of the asset and the collateral are of the same market to market. Like, it, it, you know, this is essentially what we saw in this last Bitcoin pump and break, right? Like <laughs> it was the fact yeah. that everybody was using the same asset as the collateral, you know, betting on that asset. But like reality is like, especially people who don't have money, what they want is USD. Like, I mean, they need s- stable stuff, right? They can't, they don't have enough float to survive Bitcoin's volatility. Right. I mean, th- that's that's a, a wealthier people problem. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of stable coins. I, I think like until we're a hyper recognized world, like we're going to need them. And I don't want them to be controlled by the state actors that provide the armies. So, Ben, like, how, how would you build the most simple stable coin on this setup? 
Yeah, I mean, with DLCs, you just we would create a contract where you say, like, you know, I'm going one X short, and your counterparty is going one X long. So then the, the person holding one X short, you know, they're holding Bitcoin, but they're short, so it's not even, and they're like essentially holding dollars on Bitcoin. And like to do that today um, without like any covenants, it's a little impractical, like, you know, because you're doing a bet based off the Bitcoin price and, you know, the Bitcoin price is just a number. So you're going from, you know, from zero to like, say like a hundred thousand or like a million, you have a lot of different outcomes there. And especially like in a DLC, you're trusting a, an Oracle. So maybe instead of trusting one Oracle, you want to trust like a three of five setup and like you kind of get an explosion of possible outcomes there if all the different um, Oracle outcomes or which Oracles are signing and exactly like what price they're signing. And like we were doing tests when I was at Shared Bits about of this and like we did like a bet on the Bitcoin price with like two of three Oracle setup. And it was something like 80,000 possible outcomes with like all the optimizations we did. So we sent around like, you know, 10 megabytes of signatures. It took like, you know, it's a couple minutes to sign. And it was like, you know, it's ridiculous. And it's like, you know, it works like on our laptop, like, you know, it's, you know, eight cores and all this stuff. But, you know, making an actual user friendly thing on an app is like not really going to happen with that. Um, at least, you know, not anytime soon, with, but with the, uh, the covenants route would make it a lot more simpler where, you know, we're not doing all this, you know, huge bandwidth of signatures and stuff like that. We're just gonna calculate the Merkle tree, which, you know, it's still be a little computationally expensive, but um, ne not nearly as enough. And um, it makes it so much simpler in the protocol as well, where you, you don't need all these round trips back and forth and all this P2P stuff. You basically just generate an address, verify the other card and probably did the same thing and, you know, sign a transaction. A, a critic would say like, you know, but why, why, why not do this on AWS, right? And like, just you know, do the payouts in Bitcoin? Like, why do we need to do this on 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 Bitcoin? Why do we need this extra stuff? Trusted third parties or security holes, right? Yeah, exactly. Like you could, I mean, you could, yeah, like deposit in the Coinbase and do the bet, and then um, you know withdraw. But you know, we saw FTX worked out. We saw you know the other thousand before them worked out as well. Like, we need a kind of a way to do this natively, and like I think there is demand, like. Um, and the shitcoin space, like a lot of people are using like, you know, all their trading stuff on there. That's like, like Uniswap and blah, 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 just to like trade stuff, quote unquote, trustlessly. So there definitely is demand for this. And it seems like, you know, if, I'd rather people use Bitcoin than shitcoins to do it. So I hope it is, Bill. Ben, as I understand it, the, the big problem with doing stable coins on DLC is I guess the, the technical term is novation. So it's like if you want to treat this thing as a coin, and trade it around, you're essentially trading like a futures position around. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like, I, I've thought only briefly about it, but it, I, I couldn't figure out kind of how to do it right away. Do you have any thoughts on how that might work out? Like, is there some key delegation thing you could do? There's a way to do it. We, on, on Shirtbits, there's a few blogs on how to do it um, for like all the different setups. But I mean, essentially like, the worst case is like if your counterparty disappears, you just like open up another trade with someone and you're like double collateralized, which kind of sucks. But um, otherwise, you kind of like start like closing it with uh, your counterparty while also opening it with the new counterparty and like you're able to like kind of sell it in that way. But yeah, it kind of so, takes so, like, so it's, like it, it, so it's like an atomic thing of like I sell one position and open another position at the same time. And so my, my net exposure stays the same, but I've actually closed and opened two contracts. Yeah. So yeah, like, so like you have to say like Alice, Bob and Carol, um, yeah. Alice and Bob already have the position open and Carol wants to buy Bob's position. Basically mm -hmm. uh, you'd have like a, one transaction that's opening, um, Alice and Carol's new, uh, contract while closing, um, Bob and Alice's contract. So Bob gets the exit to, the, the setup, well, like, you know, leaving his position while Alice and Carol kind of start the new thing. And, you know, you could update the contract in there. You could pay out anyone in that transaction of like, you know, someone's like paying for a premium or something like that. So um, it should all technically be doable. It's, you know, I mean, it's with the, the, the covenant model gets a little easier because, you know, now there's less activity or an interactivity and stuff like that. So, you know, if you had to do these 80,000 uh, signatures, you know, you have to do, you know, 160,000 um, for the two parties, so this makes it like a little easier. But yeah, I was gonna say like with the covenant case, if if I've got a mobile app and on my mobile app I say like, because I, I think the best lightning app that we could ever build is kind of what Bitcoin Beach is trying to do, but theirs has a custodial backend where you have a lightning wallet and then in your lightning wallet you can say, all right, I've got 50 bucks, 
I want 30 of that to be pegged to the dollar because I can't stomach short term vol volatility. And then the other $20 I want to keep in Bitcoin. And, and like you just kind of drag the slider, right? But if every time you do that, if I'm opening a new position and we use DLCs as they exist today and me and my counterparty have to trade and sign 80,000 CETs, like contract execution transactions, that's insane from like a mobile phone. And then I, I have to do that like every time I, I drag the slider versus if every time I drag the slider, you know, yeah, I'm hashing a bunch of, you know, CETs locally into a Merkle tree and then we trade one commitment, both sign a transaction, we're done. Like that's something that I could actually imagine happening. So are either you guys gonna, you know, like advocate for either CTV or kind of whatever your, your preferred mechanism is? Because I know there's, there's talk about like simplicity. There's talk about, uh, these more general fancy covenant structures. Um, but I, I think there's just, there's in my view, like a ton of time difference between now and when these things are deployable and proven safe. So, I mean, what's, what's your guys' plan? I mean, simplicity would be the best thing, but like that is so far away. Like, I don't think it's reasonable to talk about. I looked at the patch set on elements that's up right now. It's 77,000 lines plus. <laughs> Dude, it's, 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 it's a year of the Linux desktop. It's next year. <laughs> <laughs> and, and spoiler alert, like the code is not breezy. It's not uh, like a nice Python, yeah, yeah, sure. you know, it's, it's like hard to read. So, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, like one of the things that I like about the Op Vault proposal is that I think it is more specific and I think it's easier for people to see a straight line from that proposal to actually use cases that gain market traction and actually add value for Bitcoin users. I think you can have a really, really good debate about do we want to have a really general purpose covenant structure that takes a long time to figure out if it's safe or do we want to just hold tight for simplicity? Like if, if the goal is that eventually we're going to have either super general covenants or simplicity, but that's like in the future, I think there's a reasonable case to be made that, okay, in the near term, let's, let's do something sooner that, you know, adds value now, but doesn't try to go 90% of the way to a super general purpose covenant scheme. Like I, I, I think I'd be less inclined to say, let's do really super generic covenants and then also try to do simplicity because there's a little bit too much overlap there. Whereas something something like Op Vault, I think is you know much more targeted and kind of adds value to that. I'm, I'm definitely going to shill Op Vault in the, in the short term. But I do think, I mean, if you look at the patch set for CTV, like it's a very well scoped, limited change. Uh, a yeah. lot of people have spent uh, a lot of time, you know, trying to pick it apart. God knows everybody wants to dunk on Jeremy. And so, and there's money there to be made if you, if you find right. the problem. So, so like just before we go into activation and like sort of like a, and sort of like a path to sale, right? It's a sales job. One more thing I wanted to just address uh, in terms of like features and, and like benefits of this is, uh, you know, in terms of lightning, like, like what what benefits do like some of the, the lightning setups right now would have like sort of like immediate improvement because right now lightning doesn't scale, right? I mean, like, it, it, you know, it's cute and all. We can have say a hundred, like fifty million people using it, but we cannot have say like half a billion people using lightning. It's like actually impossible. So, do we get some extra sort of like breathing room on lightning with Opvault? I think it's plausible that Opvault might help to compress the witness sizes for lightning tra transactions a little bit. But to be honest, I think that that might be marginal. I mean, you'd need someone who's really, really in the weeds on Lightning to, to sit here and tell you um, whether or not there is some kind of significant kind of game-changing improvement there. But from my impression, I think it's, it's, it'd be a nice little marginal compression maybe, but it, it wouldn't be like a, a game-changer. Okay. Yeah, maybe there is some benefits to coins pools as well, uh, as well as scaling solutions that are possible with constructions that are close to app vaults, uh, but a bit more generalistic, such as tap, if update, verify. I think there is definitely value with that. If there is a spectrum between just doing CTV and doing simple CD, maybe in the middle there is doing something like uh, tap if update verify, maybe with some kind of checkout puts verify, I think it would complete the, 
what you need to do volts. So the, the, the trade-off there, if you do sort of more low-level granular opcodes like like T-Love or check outputs, then mm -hmm. you know everybody comes up with kind of this standardized vault construction that you have to encode in script. And everybody's basically doing the same thing, but like the script sizes are huge. And so, you know, these transactions end up being very costly. Um, and I'm not even sure, to be honest, if you can get the same behavior from a vault that you can like just with those two opcodes, because there is some special logic around supporting immediate revaults during unvaults and things like that. So it's, you know, I, I think like something like vaults is, is a really good example of even if you had the super futuristic flying car covenants, it's like, well, maybe you still want out vault because it's a very common usage that you want to compress. Well, we don't know if it's yet a very useful, uh, very used, well, a very common use case. We don't know yet. And I don't think, well, I'm not buying that it would be so much more expensive to do with stuff if I did verify what you're doing with Upvolt. It, it could be, but you know, nobody's shown me the scripts. Like nobody's written me the scripts. Like show me the code. People come up with these like highfalutin proposals and it's like, well, okay, maybe that sounds like good. And if I squint at it, I can interpret it in such a way, but like, where are the patches, you know? Yeah. Show up with patches. Yeah. Uh, so I agree. I agree with regards to the implementation and that's something that uh, I was I was wanting to, to look into, I wanted to implement the tap day verify on Revolt, like just implementing Revolt with tap day verify, which would basically give up Vault in a bit more generalistic way, but I never came to do it. But AJ in this uh, original tap day verify post as a Vault construction that is close, well, it's not really a freeze all my funds recovery path like you have on up Vault, but it's a revolt path that, that keeps revolting. Uh, it's a it's a decent vault construction with the details of the scripts that seems to work. So I haven't seen an implementation. I read all those posts. They seem to me to be very vague. And and I've been working closely with AJ on this proposal. Actually, he's he he gives me feedback on a, on a semi daily basis in terms of how to how to guide the proposal. But I'm not buying the T love stuff until I see the code. Yeah, sure, that's fine. So like, if we had to just like sort of like wrap up the benefits. Right, like of this for like your average user, right? Like out there who is going to be engaging in hats and uh, and other means of getting things into Bitcoin dramatically or undramatically. Like, what, what would you say are like the 10 main sort of like one liners that, like, okay, like we like we activate this today, like you, you gain this set of lists like nearly immediately right like assuming of course there's a ui to use it and stuff but like you know it's like very achievable very simple very safe like you know you get this yeah so my tagline has kind of been you get um the operational complexity of single sig with multi-sig security multi-sig safety and uh, you know, personally, if I could do this for my own funds, I would I would sleep a lot better at night because I could have coins in cold storage and I could be alerted if if somehow in any number of a million different ways, you know, my infrastructure got compromised, my, you know, Rodolfo backdoored my my cold card, you know, um, I, there's just a million different ways you can get popped. And uh, I, I don't want to rely on having built the perfect fortress and pre-anticipated everything. And so I, I, I want to be able to have reactive security. And I think OpVault is to date like kind of the, the most straightforward, easiest to use way to do that. So like, you know, essentially you get like, you know, like end user sort of like amazing security with like, you know, you can build some fairly safe, straightforward scripts that sort of like handle normal people's money problems. You can have institutional problems resolved. You can uh, you can create. There, there, there's probably also like a middle thing in there too, right? Like there's been a lot of discussion about things like um, e-cash mints, right? Like Cashew or um, Fetty. Fetty Mint. And, you know, like this would also be an upgrade for their setup because like what those systems are, is they're basically just smaller custodians, right? Yep. And so if, if you want to Uncle Jim funds for your family, your friends, your community, your school, whatever, and give them like a very private lightning wallet via Chami and eCash, it would be great if you could upgrade your security setup without like dramatically increasing operational complexity. Yeah, so... 
you know, you get the DLCs, right? So we can finally have yeah. like you know, like some some interesting dynamic stable coins or any other kinds of dynamic contracts really uh, uh, being represented in the actual chain, right? Or protected by the chain. And we get some simplicity. I, I mean, like you know, Upvault is is a very it's like it's a small patch. It, it's uh, it's a small. I mean, compared to other things that do covenants, like this is like my new school. Totally. Right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think at least I have not bumped into like very reasonable, like uh, very strong opposition from anybody who understands this stuff. Uh, so like I, I don't know like it, it feels like a, a very like sort of sane next feature for any for when everybody is sort of like in the mood of getting next feature and you resolve the fee problem, which is kind of a huge deal. I think that the rest of the un the unresolved things are more practical, right? Like how to handle the keys and how to sort of do things in the UI. It's sort of like the implementation real sort of like issues, uh, but those things are true for everything that you build new. So now, like we sort of like we should start addressing like the hard part, right? Can can we go through some of like let's try to steel man some of the some of the realistic sort of criticism and risks, and also maybe some of the most absurd ones. Especially, I think like addressing absurd things is very important because you know this stuff is not simple, right? So like pe people don't don't get it. Yeah, maybe if I can add something, maybe some nuances to the use case of Vault, because obviously I'm a big fan of Vault, mm -hmm. and I've been, or maybe the more nuanced than I was at the beginning, uh, after uh, trying to solve all the issues, especially with the in actual implementation and deployment of these solutions, because it's not all in the scripts uh, and having an MVP, but trying to figure out what fear resolves that you're going to use and how you're going to manage this fear reserve and how you're going to use them is a huge problem. And that has huge consequences on the security of your setup as well. So yeah, just to give more nuance on this is that basically vaults give you spending policies. Uh, to give you spending policies mm -hmm. and you can have spending policies today with uh, a cosigner. So you could always have an HSM that enforces co-signing policies and that uh, is going to, well, you can always trust that this policy is going to be enforced as long as you trust the HSM. So it's a single point of view. And vaults give you the uh, possibility to have decentralized enforcement of these policies but hopefully the transaction confirms. So it's a trade. And it's always hot. See, this is the part that people don't get about like HSMs, generally speaking, is that you know banks have been doing this forever, right? I mean, they mm -hmm. have essentially spend policy HSM. HSM is a hardware security module, right? It's essentially a server, right? That like's made secure. It costs a lot of money, and uh, a manager needs to go and tap on it, or multiple managers go to need to tap on it, and the thing turns on, turns off, and you can add more spending policies that have been audited. Let's put it this way, mm -hmm. and you know that's completely unrealistic for Bitcoin, right? Because banks have they can do backsees, they can roll back. They get hacked all the time, but they get to roll back because it's just fiat, it's just IOUs, right? They call the bank, the receiver bank, and say, hey, you know that money? Yeah, there was hacked, send it back, right? And they just change their ledgers and it's great. Uh, with Bitcoin, the money's gone. So, you know, we, we don't have a way of doing that in a secure way, right? Like any server that is hot on Bitcoin is a matter of time between before it gets hacked and also... Maybe the controlling keys that may not be able to, like maybe they can't hack the server itself, but they can maybe change the policies with some other key. So go ahead, go ahead, Antoine. But yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you say, just that it's trade off and you might, uh, you, you need to be willing to get into the assumption that the transaction is actually going to get confirmed before the end of the delay, because with an HSM, it, it, the policy is actually enforced every time, as long as you trust it. But <laughs> With percent transactions, the policy, there is no single point of failure, but it might not be enforced if people are trying to, to fuck with you by filling all the blocks, for instance, if they mm -hmm. outprice you out of the block space. And so you might want to consider having high fee reserves. And if you have high fee reserves, it means that you, it's only for very high value volts. And well, no, I mean, you, you might consider having large delays. But then you want only to have large day for large value uh, spendings. So you might only use vaults for very large value, but then you, 
it's going to be a huge incentive to, to price you out because it's one transaction that if you get to sensor, you, you can steal, essentially. So yeah, it's a trade-off. How, how would you handle sort of like, you know, some watchtowers or something, right? Like the, you, you need something watching the stuff and let you know what's going on, right? It's not like the blockchain is going to call you. So uh, how, would you, how would you do this? Because, you know, again, you need to know that something happened to the coins. Yeah, so um, like many things with this proposal, there's a lot of optionality on the part of the end user here. And it kind of depends on how much you want to actually trust the watchtower, right? Like if you have full trust in the watchtower, you can basically just hand it um, the location of the vaults or some descriptor that tells you where all the vaults are. And then, you know, the, the information necessary to actually do a recovery transaction. And the, the risk there is that if the watchtower turns on you, they can just like sweep all of your coins into the recovery path, which might be annoying. I mean, you're not going to lose the coins, but it just might be annoying because your recovery path is presumably difficult to recover um, because it's difficult to access. If you, if you, on the other end of the spectrum, if you don't trust anything at all about the vault, I mean, at, uh, about the watchtower, you could give it some compact block filter like object or a bloom filter like object. And it would basically alert you every time it saw something move on chain that might be one of your vaults. Um, so there would be a lot of false positives and you would have to have software kind of running on your end that's like getting notified and then checking, okay, well, you know, is this actually an out point that I care about or not? And then there's like a whole range of stuff in between there. Like one thing you might do is you could give the watchtower some information that's encrypted with other information that's only revealed when a vault is being unvaulted. And then it could, you know, kind of intervene and broadcast. That's more like a flag, right? Like if this flag is raised... You know, I see the flag. And what's cool about this is that it does not review amounts. It does not dox UTXOs, none of this stuff, really, right? It could be easily done in that way. Because yeah. you don't want the server knowing how much coins you have, what the UTXOs are. Because all those things, it's like, when bad, if bad guys don't know how much money there is, they're less likely to do something. Yep. And also, James mentions uh, with uh, trusting one watchtower on it, but you probably want to have several uh, of them as well, because, uh, and then it gets into issues with the fear reserves as well, because you might not trust only one watchtower, and not trusting it is not only that there might be many issues, but it might just get compromised. And compromising for watchtower is not actually getting control of the server, it's just cutting internet access, and it just can't enforce the policy anymore. So you might want to have plenty of watchtowers, but for each of them, you want to have different fear reserves, because if they were to share fear reserves, then one of the main issues, uh, watchtowers could actually steal the funds from under the other watchtowers. So you need to duplicate all the fear reserves for the actual enforcement on all the watchtowers. So it really needs to be high value uh, vaults again. So like another sort of like thing that came up during CTV uh, was like, you know, is there a concern for Bitcoin's fungibility, actual fungibility, not sellability, right? So, so like, you know, now you have these coins, they're kind of trapped in these things. And, you know, are we creating some new sort of incentive structure that we maybe don't understand, right? I mean, like, you know, Taproot gave us dick butts, right, on the blockchain. <laughs> so, like, with every new feature... Right. I mean, like you could get dick butts. So I hope that becomes a term of art. I hope, you know. I, yeah. I mean, 100 percent. I, I, ex- I want dick butts to be the representation of possible Bitcoin <laughs> surface attack. So it, it really sums the whole thing up. It, it yeah, does, for sure. Right? Perfect. Dick butts yeah. on the blockchain. So that's what uh, 4x block size increase, which is the original sin, in my view, gave us in conjunction, right, with this other amazing thing, which was Taproot that removed the the script limit right on the witness and and it's also discounted right so you have discounted big blocks with dick butts <laughs> sounds like a porn it, it does right you know like have you guys thought about like some of this this fungibility more sort of like economical concerns around this i, I think with vaults it's pretty minimal i mean the the, the classic 
you know, concern that everybody has with uh, recursive covenants, or in other words, covenants that can continue indefinitely is like, oh, well, you know, if we have that, then, you know, they're going to roll out GovCoin tomorrow. And, you know, all the, the I'm going to have to get a signature from the Treasury Department to spend my coins. And, oh, God, it's going to be horrible. The reality is that that's already possible today in a way that's much more convenient than covenants would be. You know, we have multi-sig. So if tomorrow the government orders Coinbase, you know, to have all their withdrawals encumbered in a two of two, um, then we're already toast anyway. So I think covenants don't really add any risk in that sense. Uh, I, I, I talked to it, so I, I agree with you, James, but I talked with people that actually don't buy these arguments, uh, saying that actually mm. reversing the policy is would be a hard fork with Covenant, but would not be with the Maltzig. I think that's a fair criticism, but the issue is even beforehand. If you're opting in, like with a Covenant, you need to opt in, you need to, you need to send your coins into it. So if you're opting in, into a covenant, you, you might even, I don't know, opt into the government altcoin in the first place. And so you, you might opt into not using Bitcoin. If they can force you to use the, the government covenants, they can use, uh, force you to use uh, their own currency. So I don't think it, it should be a concern mm -hmm. in the first place. You know, I, I always like to say that the, the state actors like to, to do the low friction approach, which is just knock on your door. Uh, you know, drag you to some uh, some very uncomfortable place and just say, hey, listen, give me the keys or you can't leave, right? And most people will try to stay there for a little bit of time and maybe you're just very, uh, uh, very good at staying there a little longer. But eventually, you know, people will sing, right? Yeah, they're much better at doing that than writing Bitcoin script. I exactly. Well, and especially like like two things that I think a lot of people miss when they're worried about the GovCoin covenant encumbrance. One of them is exactly what was just said, which is, you know, when you generate a receive address, your receive address has to commit to the covenant in order for your coins to now be encumbered by the covenant. So if I just generate a plain old, um, you know, pay to tap root single sig address, then you like you can't send me coins that are now that like I now can't spend because I didn't commit to the covenant. That that's like one thing that's important to understand. The other thing that's really important to understand is that if you use covenants to enforce some kind of whitelisting mechanism where like coins can only be sent to you know people on the list, and if you eat too much beef this month, then you can't spend your money. Like whatever whatever the doomsday scenario is. Anytime you want to change the contents of that list or the semantics of that list, you have to regenerate the covenants. And so it's, it's from, from like an operational perspective, it's a very not scalable solution. Something like having a co-signing server and having all your coins en encumbered with like a two of two multi-sig is way more scalable because some bureaucrat can just push a button and add or remove entries from the list. And then that list goes into a policy enforcement engine that decides whether or not to co-sign a spend. That's like actually how people would build things. There's actually a, a product from Blockstream called AMP that does exactly this thing for registered assets. So if you want to go and like play with it, they have a demo site and you can issue yourself a, a restricted asset. But yeah, and then to NVK's point, all of this stuff is moot if they just drag you out of your, you know your house and put you in a box and say you're using um, you know GovCoin now, right? Like so the, the the covenant thing I think is a little bit of a red herring, um, and it's it's not a, a good argument. I think you know once you you sort of like get into a little bit more practical flag theory as well, you know you start having the recovery, for example, nuclear keys and mm -hmm. XORed in two separate different countries. And listen, if you have enough money that you are a person that of concern, right? A prescribed person or whatever, however your your state actor like to call these people, you know, you probably have a little bit more means and you're gonna probably start sort of like distributing yourself outside of single jurisdiction and provably too. Right. So maybe maybe, you know, if they point the gun at you, you, you know, that vault that was not touched just disperses to, you know, your Monaco, you know, P.O. box. Right. Like and there's nothing they can do, really. These things gets like a, a little sort of like they, they get weird very fast. I, I'm not very concerned about state actors. Uh, I just I guess like my concern is more like, you know, do we have some blind sign on like a blind side, uh, being blindsided on some economic, uh, you know, nuance that, that gets missed. Maybe drive chains. Uh, I don't know much 
about drive chains, but it's something that has been not going to happen. People, <laughs> you, you know, like, uh, and maybe, maybe I should just bring it up. Like the CTV, I, I absolutely love the work that was put into BIP uh, 119 and, and like, and Ruben, absolutely brilliant kid. Yep. But I think, you know, a lot of people don't like this, but you know, Bitcoin is still people, people change software and a hundred years from now, it's going to be different people. Uh, so they may change the software very differently than we do now. But, you know, once you burn yourself sort of like politically to the economic nodes, which are people, uh, I find it extremely unlikely that you can do things, especially if they're very complex and they sound like some crazy shit that people can't understand, like CTV. So, you know, drive chains changes a lot of incentives, a lot of complication on Bitcoin. I like to call it soft fork hell. Because essentially that's what it is. It's just going to soft fork Bitcoin for infinitum, right? And uh, and then CTV is like absolutely amazing, right? But God knows, man. I mean, like, it's just it's like, I don't think my brain can comprehend what can be done with that thing to be able to say like with some, at least feeling confident that like it's, it's not more than just dick butts. I think that's the thing, you know, with, with, I mean, so CTV, like you said, it's a very small patch set, but to your point, evaluating something like CTV, evaluating like OpCat, like these are very, they're simple mechanisms that can build a lot of different stuff. And the conceptual surface area of what can be built is is a lot higher than like a proposal like check lock time verify or op vault where like you can fuzz test the shit out of the the interface and and be reasonably certain that you've like kind of exercised the the full span of the space that that you know it enables whereas like with these more open ended things it's it's harder to get an intuition for what's actually possible Sorry, somebody dropped some bait here on the chat. I am not going to open any link that has drive chain on the URL. <laughs> There's just a, a blog post from Jeremy Rubin where he showed like you could kind of recreate drive chains with any prev out. So like, I mean, I'm a big fan of any prev out. I think there's a lot of cool things, but I am not a fan of drive chain. So it's, you know, there's a lot of weird things like this. Yeah, exactly. And we see DD as well. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, the, the people who, who have a more sort of like flexible, big composition space mindset really gets drawn to this. Like you see this with like Fiat Jaff as well, big supporter of that, creator of Noster, right? And Noster is like the complete opposite of Bitcoin. It's like rough consensus, <laughs> but it's simple, very flexible. That's not add a lot of rules, right? Like, because yeah. also like it's trying to do something completely different, right? And, and I, I think like, you know, galaxy brains sort of like start to get like a little lost in in sort of like what's acceptable to a certain purpose versus another. And a lot of the pushback into new features and things on Bitcoin comes from this sort of like, hey, you know, can we not break this incredible, amazing thing by just adding this one more thing that we really want? Maybe this is a good segue to sort of like start thinking like, okay, great. Let's say Upvault, like extreme low risk, at least it is in my view, uh, adds an incredible amount of security that Bitcoiners are going to need, in, you know, if we don't want to go to jail or get killed for our coins. And, and I think that on itself is the sale pitch. It's yep. like, listen, you don't want to get killed, kidnapped, or like arrested, right? Uh, for your coins. Like you want to have a peaceful sleep at night technology. Without enabling dick butts. Exactly. Without dick. Well, we don't know yet. Maybe. I don't know, sure. man. Casey, brilliant guy. Super creative. Yeah, you know, sure. he's he's going to find a way of like dick budding, you know, <laughs> it took no contract. Also, also, like, James mentioned this earlier. Ordinals are compatible with vaults. So you That's could true. vault your dick butt. Yes. Like it doesn't create new dick butts, but it does create new ways of securing your dick butt. By the way, we're doing an episode on uh, Ordinals. Rindal is uh, joining me. Are you going to have Casey on? Yes. Oh, that'll be fun. Probably next week. So anyways, how, how do we activate this? How do we convince people? How do we, because we can't even agree on how to activate shit. And as I like to say, it should be excruciatingly horrible experience to try to activate anything, to discourage even the most hopeful people to not do it. Because, you know, activation is the ultimate bad attack surface of Bitcoin, right? Like it's adding shit to it. So like, how, how do we go about uh, maybe activating this thing? Just a few thoughts. I mean, I, I don't, want to play a massive role. I mean, I, I don't want to unilaterally push this thing, obviously, because that just doesn't doesn't work. Um, 
But you know, my hope is that the value will be so obvious and, and that there will be people who take time to evaluate the proposal like you, like um, you know, Alex Leishman did a lot of tweeting a few days ago, you know, the CEO of River about like how valuable this would be. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the people at NIDIG are, are pretty positive on it. Um, and so I, I just hope there's kind of like this overwhelming sense of like, wow, this, this is pretty low risk and, and pretty high value. And, you know, it's something that we want. And the other note that I'd like to make is like, there was a time where for things like check clock time, verify, check sequence, verify, like these were like purpose specific tools and their activation wasn't full of drama. It wasn't this huge, massive thing that people freaked out about. And we actually did those like, you know, in rapid succession kind of around SegWit. So I, I kind of hope, you know, I mean, SegWit and Taproot have been very profound, complicated changes that have been, you know, I think generally positive massively, but um, it's a full change to Bitcoin. We added a new crypto. It's primitive. like a platform it, change. It, it, yeah. it's a whole new thing. By the way, yeah. I want to do an episode on just explaining people what SegWit actually is. I don't think people understand. So crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and V-Bytes and all the stuff that we did that nobody understood. Completely. <laughs> Look, yeah. like I work on core as my full time job and I have to routinely reread, you know, the bips for SegWit and Taproot because I forget all the details and I forget all the nuance. And, you know, when ordinals and the inscriptions came out, I forgot that Taproot had removed, you know, the 10,000 byte limit on on witness scripts. So like these these changes are massive. Um, Obval, not massive. And I hope activation can be. So, you know. so maybe 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 like, you know, the way we start addressing this is to explain that like this is a gardening job. This is not a construction job, right? I mean, like yeah. we're adding a small primitive, right? It's just like, you know, other little things that we do, because again, people don't understand the difference between the little things mm -hmm. and the big things, right? You know, maybe drawing sort of like analogies to like, you know, like, uh, for example, lock time verify, you know, like, okay, so this one did this, you know, uh, up vault is going to do this, right? And and not sort of blow this thing up out of proportion, not try to say like this is a massive feature and even though it does enable a lot of things. I think like how we frame this and, and how we sort of like start addressing the people that don't want changes because, you know, they're kind of right. I mean, we don't want changes to Bitcoin. We want just, at least in my view, gardening. Well, and like um, something that I'm cautiously optimistic about here is I think a lot of times when people have software proposals, they end up in a chicken and egg situation of trying to prove demand where it's like somebody's like, oh, I want to build this new opcode that'll let us do coin pools. And I think a reasonable pushback is like, well, no, like demonstrate in the market <laughs> that people want that. Right. Like, like, like show, show that there's enough demand that it's worth the dick butt risk to go and build coin pools. And I think what's, what's cool is that because you can build vault like setups that have a bunch of trade offs out of things like you know, pre-signed transactions, ephemeral keys, and uh, relative lock times, like people like Revault and other groups can go and build products in the market, have customers, and then say, hey, look, even with these trade-offs, people want solutions that are shaped like this. Wouldn't it be great to be able to just eliminate a whole class of these trade-offs and have it be enforced by consensus rules instead? And that might be a more compelling argument to the economic majority than just saying, like, here's a really great idea that I have. Yeah, I agree with uh, that it would be useful for evil, but two things. First, I really don't want to be in, uh, into into pushing for consensus changes for, for my company. And two, I actually don't think we should, we, well, not rush, but I don't think we should go with activating anything, any, well, not too soon. So there's been a lot of Covenant proposal floating around. Uh, there is still, people are still working on Covenant proposals that are not announced yet. So there is a lot of research going into it. So I think it would be premature to, to activate anything. Uh, to, to what would be the least disruptive way of getting this in? Even if it was like maybe like not fully featured? I think something to keep in mind as well is like we don't have to do op vault and that's it for covenants. Like we could do op vault and CTV and APO. No, I know, I know, I know. But I but mean, like it's not gonna be all at once, yeah. But. The way that the people like if you use some EQ here, right? The, the way that <laughs> a lot's true, yes. Listen, like Bitcoin is politics, it's people and you have to convince people. So uh, this is why I'm asking, it's like, what is the best way we can sort of like dip our toes into this? Or like, how can we propose like a way of activating this that is like not a big deal? 
right? Because it's not a big deal. Yeah. So, I mean, I was writing the bit before I got on this call. I want to put that out there. The implementation, frankly, is mostly complete. There's a rich suite of functional tests that I've got to add some stuff to, but like largely I've like written a wallet basically to functional test this thing. So the, the implementation is all there. You can see exactly how it works. So my hope is that I, you know, I can put it out there and people can spend time getting familiar with it. Um, maybe sketch out some, you know, really do some in-depth thinking on like what the use case is actually look like for end users and then hopefully it just becomes obvious that, that it's something we want and we and we activate it with a speedy trial or something like that but you know I, I think Antoine makes a good point about you know not activating too quickly but I do want to push back a little bit and say like, look, I'm not wedded to Opvault. I, I came up with it, like it, it originated as a thought experiment. I just wanted a benchmark uh, against like, what would the perfect vault construction be? I wasn't even thinking about implementing it. And then I was like, oh, well, you know, I should give it a shot. And so I tried to implement it and it worked. But if, if something comes around that's like categorically better, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for that, you know. I, that's often how it works. I mean, like, you know, Taproot had like 50 different sort of ways that sort of like went here and there, you know, Segwit was the same thing, you know, like these things are never like the original proposal who really makes it. Yeah, right. And, and that's why I sort of like, I guess I brought it up, like, you know, maybe there is like a, a version that's like feels like more like a compromise yeah. and, and sort of like feels like a little bit more restrained and, and that's how you kind of start to get it in and then maybe gets more featured as it comes closer to activation. The point that I wanted to make though is that like custody is like a real problem right now. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, people, are, people are losing coins, you know, insurance is, is, is basically not doable. Um, you know, it's it, it, the situation right now is pretty bad and we're we're all like used to it and so maybe we don't realize how bad it is but like it could be a lot better so i'm not i'm not really wild about the prospect of waiting like three years for some you know ultra perfect covenant proposal to come along that like maybe kind of emulates op vault you know i think i'd like to put the proposal out there see what the objections are and if someone is like hey i really don't like that we can you know um do this dlc thing with the, so, the hack then maybe you know if i if i have to like if sort of like really address what I think it's going to happen is that it's not going to necessarily, I don't think the criticism is going to come regarding the actual nuances of op vault or op vault. It's, reactivation. it's the idea is like the problem is I think speedy trial like pissed off enough people yep. and, uh, and it was kind of like fell rammed through by, you know, the, the cabal of core developers, right? Like, so there is that bad taste in the mouth of a lot of economic nodes out there. The dick butts certainly did not help. And I still think we don't have a good way of activating stuff. And we sort of like, yeah. we're a little PTSD from mm -hmm. things. So it's not going to be up fault. It's going to be like, I don't want to change Bitcoin, right? So, and, and yep. I think a lot of the people who criticize changing Bitcoin, they're correcting the sentiment of not wanting to change Bitcoin, but they don't also don't understand that like software doesn't live forever without gardening. Like, you know, the stuff that's running on your computer today doesn't run tomorrow. And you need the people who understand the code base to sort of upgrade it for new hardware, for for new concerns, for you know Unix, <laughs> you know time problems. Right. And th there's all these things that need to change. And and you know when my good friend uh, Steve says fire the devs, uh, I understand why it feels that way, and I kind of agree in a way because you know like. Core, I addressed this in the last episode, it kind of feels like this, it's like Internet Explorer has 99% of the market. It doesn't rule the internet, but kind of rules the internet. And, you know, it has this sort of like bad taste by the CTV people as well, where, hey, if you don't get the right people on Core to like your idea, it doesn't get activated to you. So these are the gatekeepers. But, you know, like, realistically speaking in software, like, there's always just like a literal handful of people who understand the, the whole banana and are the people who are qualified to truly have an opinion. You know, like Facebook used to have five guys merging the code of 5,000 people. You know, in our shop, like we have, you know, Doc Hex and, and if it doesn't get through his shit, like it's not going to get through. And, and very few people have the full picture, right, of that code base. And, and those people are often not the best people selling themselves or selling the code. So, and, and I think like Bitcoin is sort of like suffering at this right now, like that that's the current sort of like cold and sneeze that Bitcoin has. And, and you know, may, maybe, maybe up vault is the simple thing that 
helps us find a better way of of activating things and sort of talking about these things. So maybe James, like you know, you, you're very good at sort of like tech and also dealing with people. Like maybe you should champion this, you know. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and I'll champion it to the degree that I don't feel like it's actually impairing the the proposal. You know, I, I again, I don't want to feel like I'm pushing this really hard, and and I want to be clear, I'm totally agnostic about activation parameters. To be to be frank, that's not something I've thought a lot about. So, I don't really care exactly how the activation works. There are probably other you know galaxy brains who can weigh in on that and suggest some stuff, and and maybe this process will uh, motivate me to kind of play a bigger role in that and try and understand some of the different approaches a little bit better and the objections that people have. But I think you're totally right that right now, Bitcoin is a little bit wandering in the desert. And, you know, the last two massive changes have been led by a, a real small group of people. And I think we all have this muscle memory of kind of relying on them to sort of say, okay, yeah, this is the blessed next step for Bitcoin, and I think they very rightfully realize that that's not healthy. They earned that. They are. They earned it for sure. Uh, I mean, listen. Th- how many people in the planet can actually review Libsec? Like seriously, like two? Yeah, yeah. I like, mean, like fully, 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 fully understand what truly is going on in there. Like, I don't think there's more than two people. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. <laughs> it, it, you, you can definitely count it on one hand. Like you could argue if it's two yeah. or four, but it's definitely yeah. like right. One it, yeah. it, but, but this is like, I think we do a very poor job at representing the the technical problems to people who are not technical, like just conveying these realities, right? Like you know, people in this space, you know, like my ANCAP comrades, uh, sort of like love to talk about meritocracy and things like that, but. You know, part of the meritocracy understanding that you have absolutely no fucking idea how Bitcoin works and you have absolutely no qualification to also understand what they're trying to change. And, and you know, there is always going to be a little bit of this sort of like bad taste of a technocracy. Right. And it's it feels weird in Bitcoin. Right. Because it's your money. It's your node. But you're trusting somebody else's code, if you, especially if you can't read the code. Totally. Uh, and it's like the, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Did you? No, no, no. Go ahead. It's like just yeah. how, how do we improve this? Well, I was, I was going to say it's the, the situation that it's very much like is taking your car to the mechanic, right? Like you take your car to the mechanic. This guy knows what he's doing, but there's also a good chance he's trying to screw you. Like yes. there's also a good chance he's trying to charge you, you know, 20 to hundred percent more than, than, than you actually pay, maybe do some unnecessary work. And so you're in this awkward position where you can't do this work yourself. You can't even evaluate the proposed fix, but, but you also don't want to get screwed. And as we see in medicine, like there can be situations where the group of experts is like dead wrong. And well, they're sold out. I mean, like, right. you know, there's a lot of different interests in Bitcoin. Right? We don't know people's motivations. Like, it is realistically impossible to know them. Right. So it's important to retain your bullshit detector. It's important to retain the, the culture that makes sure that no change in Bitcoin violates the property rights of the system. But at the same time, I think the best you can do if, if you're not a technical person yourself is like you go out and you consult a lot of car mechanics, right? You get you get a lot of prices. And I mean, that's kind of the best that we can do. But I don't know if you guys have other thoughts. Well, I mean, so another thing that um, is a relatively recent development is I think AJ set up Bitcoin Inquisition, which is, you know, like, let's proactively merge different software proposals into a signet so that people can play with them on a shared network. And so, you know, um, unlike some of the more ambiguous, ambitious, like big change proposals, because OpVault is really targeted at like a very specific shape of use cases, maybe there's an easier path here of, you know, it ends up on something like Bitcoin acquisition, people can build little dummy wallets and, you know, like normal users can get a little bit of stick time playing with, okay, what would custody in a post op vault world look like and demonstrate that this is better. And so even if you don't know whether or not the mechanic is trying to screw you, you can at least kind of take it for a test drive first. Like there, there, there might be some stuff like that where it's less about how do we go and win the rhetorical fight on Reddit and it's more about, you know, what can we do to like incrementally de-risk the proposal so that, you know, the, the community like understands what they're signing up for. 
I mean, there was a lot of that at Taproot, right? Like yeah. there was a lot of sort of working groups and things like that. But Taproot still felt pretty like rammed through. Well, I mean, like right? I, I, I went and found like Optech did a workshop on Taproot, I think two years before activation. So like, you know, you could write code and, and watch videos about Taproot, but it's still, you know, people still felt like it was sprung on them. Taproot is just so hard. It's so, it's so hard. Yeah, it's so sure. hard to get your, I mean, I, you know, I had to really, the only, um, I, 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 until very recently didn't, I feel like fully understand Taproot, you know, for this proposal, I had to write a bunch of tests. It's all on Taproot. And there were things that I just kind of didn't, you know, didn't understand. And I, I, I found it pretty difficult to get mm -hmm. sort of valid Taproot constructions. Um, and I, and I basically relied on sort of the example code that other people had written. So it, it was, you know, it's a very, again, I'm, I'm massively positive on Taproot. I think it's awesome, but it was like so difficult to get your arms around, even as a deeply technical person. Uh, I wanted to, to address as well. You said that it was a small group of people, but why it's true that it was a small group of people that, that got it for Taproot. It, I found that it was, there was a lot of demands and they definitely set a high bar. Well, there was a lot of demands, a decade of research. When did we start uh, discussing Merkley scripts in 2012 or something oh, with Russell yeah. Connell? Yeah. yeah, years ago. So yeah, a decade of research, a lot of involvement and of a lot of people in the community with the workshops, a lot of in involvement with the activation. And maybe that's why as well, people are, are not happy with it because they were actually involved. And uh, so, so I, yeah, I think Tapri did put a, a very high, not high bar, but reasonable bar for in community involvement and, and normal user involvement. Well, like Schnorr Schnorr is for a similar thing. Like people have been wanting Schnorr in Bitcoin for years. See, like, you know, the Schnorr is funny that you brought that up. Like, I, you know, it's always been a concern of mine that like, what if ECDSA is backdoor, right? And it's not revealed for a long time and there is no proof for, for ECDSA. So, you know, the idea of like, and again, this is a fundamental change to Bitcoin, right? Adding another crypto primitive, it's like crazy different. So, you know, but just having a secondary fallback crypto primitive in Bitcoin before we're big enough that state actors are, are going to that extent, right? It's pretty cool. Thanks, Antoine. Antoine is, uh, is stepping out. Appreciate it. But now, like, you know, we have this sort of like the, the fights have always been hard, uh, you know, up return limit back in 2009, 2010, because people were concerned about the worst part of dick butts. And then you had, say, uh, P2SH was also a huge fight. The original block size changed from 32 megabytes to one megabyte. You know, SegWit was a bamboozle of most people. Uh, people did not understand that the block size increased. I don't know. I just hope that this one is not part of the contention. Like we can find a path where like this is the gardening sale, not the construction sale. I think, you know, the point Ryan Dahl made is so good. And what I love about, you know, the idea of like people taking this for a test drive en masse with uh, Inquisition is like that gives technical people who maybe don't want to work on core or, you know, don't have or time can't. to work on core or can't like they can write tooling to kind of make this an easier process to, to be able to experiment with this stuff more easily. So I just love that, um, that idea. I think something to keep in mind too, like MVK, you just went through all those different, uh, soft forks, like, you know, from like the original block size, uh, decrease to like stuff like uh, Segwit and Tapper. It's like, you didn't mention like, you know, C, um, CLTV or CSV, or like BIP 66, I think, or 68, like there's tons of BIPs that were like worse off works that just like are just normal things that happened and no one cares because they're like simple, small upgrades that are super effective. But see, here's the thing. As Bitcoin grows, right, and we have more people with their bags depending on it, the more you're going to have screech. And yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. You know, like, and, and, and that's a that's a feature, right? Like you want mm -hmm. this to be, to, to progressively become more immutable, even as a feature set. So like, you know, I think we're still in a place where like a few things could get in, but I don't think we're far from like, you know, like a, a true ossification of new features, unless, you know, like people come up with some more clever way of testing them out on main chain. 
I don't I don't see how how this gets much easier. I just think it's you know just to spice up the conversation and throw in some opposition. I think the the counterpoint to that is that I'm really worried about some future where Bitcoin the scale of Bitcoin is limited to what we have today and it becomes this gold like asset where you as a regular person as a non institution you can't actually take custody of your your Bitcoin. I, I just think that's a that's a failure mode because at that point it's just like maybe a slightly better gold that develops a paper market gets captured by governments to some extent rehypothecated all that stuff yeah i mean can we just recognize the gold lost you know it had a five thousand year run right and and, and it's like and it's an element <laughs> it is a fucking like you know universe element it conducts electricity really well <laughs> right? like i mean just like this thing lost an element lost, yeah. right? To human ingenuity, right? The MMT guys are smart as fuck, right? And and they will find a way to try to gain Bitcoin. I mean, FTX was a fiat maxi attack on Bitcoin. They inflated the Bitcoin supply by what, 20% for the epoch. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And and Bitcoin not inflating is the whole fucking point. So, uh, so like, you know, we're going to have to create defenses against fiat attacks. It's not going to be the guy using the back door on ECDSA. Extremely unlikely, right? Like, it's going to be like how they, they capture, you know, 60% of the Bitcoin custody in Coinbase, and then they start inflating that. Exactly. You know, because like, look, changes that happen at Bitcoin consensus are in the open. They're, they, you, can, you can look at the code and you can judge it for yourself. So if someone comes along and tries to change the supply schedule or the inflation rate, like that's obvious. And that's not going to be a very effective attack on Bitcoin for that reason. It's going to be exactly what you're describing. It's going to be on these higher layers, on the fiat on off ramps. Like if they want to antagonize Bitcoin, like hiring an open source developer to go and try and sneak some change in is going to be in, totally Black ineffective. List. Yeah. I mean, you know, Operation Orchestra is in full effect, right? Like let's waste everybody's time with like stupid shit. But like, you know, Think about like the whole game that just happened against Bitcoin, right? Total price suppression, coordinated or uncoordinated. So you have the the Fiat Max is doing, and come on, state backed like FTX, right? Like inflating the supply. And then you have CME adding all the possible ways for you to short Bitcoin. And then they don't give us a spot ETF to, to call these motherfuckers up, right? So So like... You know, and Bitcoin is extremely illiquid, yeah. right? Like, I mean, you have like on spot, right? Like you have like what 10% of all Bitcoin supply available on spot. So like you can't call their bullshit. And, and, and like, you know, if you just think about that for a second, it's like, holy shit. And, and this is not even like how far these guys can go. I mean, this is, this is like, this is a Sunday play for them, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I and mean, that's, that's also today, like it's something like only like, 10% of all Bitcoin is custodied on these institutions. Like if it gets worse, like with like, you know, without ball, so you can't reasonably custody lots of Bitcoin safely. Like it's going to move more and more and more on the coin base. And it becomes like an even easier attack. And like, what's the natural market response? Like, oh, well, I can't actually move my Bitcoin because it's too expensive because it's like locked up with 50 HSMs. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer a paper claim on my Bitcoin, which is custody yeah. at this institutional custody solution. And then you just start rehypothecating Bitcoin. Well, that's exactly what happened to gold. <laughs> Bingo. But NVK, you know, to, to go back to like your point, I mean, it is vitally important that we maintain this culture of not changing the premises of Bitcoin, not changing the property rights. And so people have to develop the ability to distinguish changes that that are even remotely close to challenging that versus these gardening changes where it's like, yeah, we're, you can completely understand this feature. It's not going anywhere near the viability of the system or the premises. And, you know, it's really, I mean, Bitcoin is like America and, and America relies on the founding documents, the frameworks that are tangible, but it also relies on the cultural ethos of like pushing back on ambiguous situations that challenge the premises of the system. So I totally believe like, you know, we need people out there who are skeptical, but you need to have the wisdom to be able to differentiate between things that are going to help the system versus things that challenge its premises. Yeah, I mean, like one of the longest running debates in Bitcoin, which is like, I think one of the juicier debates is should Bitcoin be money or should it be smart contract fuel? Right. And I think that anytime somebody tries to introduce a change that allows for more expressibility of script or allows for like more novel peg in mechanisms or whatever, like one of the 
pushbacks is, okay, well, Bitcoin isn't for arbitrary program execution, it's for money. What What's, you know, hopefully the thing that people can distinguish is that OpVault or something like it is doubling down on custody, right? It's on the it's name. Making, it's making the money part better, right? Yeah, you know, like my rule of thumb for Bitcoin sort of like very, very grug brain, brain like sort of framework is, uh, you know, every single Bitcoin feature serves at the store of value pleasure, right? Like that's the king, right? Anything else you add in Bitcoin is for that. You know, Bitcoin having like uncensorable transactions, it's because without that, you don't have a store of value, right? Because somebody can just make you not spend or take it from you uh, or block you. So, you know, like some privacy is for that so that you have the privacy to transact your store of value. So you protect the store of value, right? So like every single change and every single thing that I see people trying to add to it, does it, does it like really fit that box? And it's a small box. I think that was one of the original sins of the, the CTV uh, sort of like frame narrative. It was like sort of unleashing this galaxy brain into sort of like, look at all the cool shit they can do. Oh my God, this is amazing, right? Like, it's like, uh, that doesn't really help with store of value. So like, go fuck yourself kind of thing, right? Like, and, and I think they're like, if we can just like help people who are like, who may be on the fence or who may be against this proposal, for example, just understand that like this does fit that small box. Like this is like, it's in the name. And like this thing is to help you hold your coins and have property over your coins and not be capturable, right? I, I think I think this would move sort of like fairly fast and fairly straightforward. And, you know, if we have more criticism that is like completely stupid and retarded, addressed is even better too, right? Uh, we, we need to get like, things that are completely absurd addressed uh, and raised even by us. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, what if SHA-256 is broken? Well, I mean, airplanes fall from the sky, right? Everybody right. can understand that. So like, you know, 51% attack every all-time high. It comes back to Bitcoin, right? You know, well, you know, it's not like that, right? So like you have to have this sort of like very attainable China. <laughs> you have to have this very attainable, very like drug brain explanations of things because my pocket doesn't care about how complex and cool Bitcoin is. You know, I don't want to have to think too deeply about these concerns with my money. And I don't know, I, I feel like you've been doing a very good job from the things I've, I've read and sort of like seen about Op Vault and I, I just, yeah, I guess like that's where I wanted to do with this, this episode. It's like sort of like address it, see if we can pursue some paths here, you know, reflect a little bit on it. Is there like anything else you guys feel like we, we, we should address it or that we missed? I think we kind of hit on most things that I can think of, but yeah, I'm just really thankful, you know, for the opportunity. Like it was a great group of people and, um, you know, uh, your analysis is, is really important to me because I think you're one of the best people that's set up to kind of evaluate something like this, you know? And so all I want is just kind of a continuing exchange of, you know, is, does, does this work? Is this, is this right? And so I can't thank you enough for, for all that. No, I mean, listen, man, like I, I absolutely love the work. I think you're approaching this with like a good, cool head and, and like the correct humbleness because Bitcoin tend to humble us all in some way or another. <laughs> it's essentially a kick in the nuts every day. Um, so like, you know, uh, thanks Rindell and thanks Ben, uh, you know, your contribution here was like super, super amazing. Uh, thanks Antoine who's, uh, who had to leave a little early. So guys, I guess like any final thoughts and, uh, and maybe like further material for people to read, that would be great. So Rindell. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, Antoine already left, but for me, I think one of the first times that the notion of vaults really clicked was I was actually reading the docs for Revault. So if you go to Revault's page, they have like a link about how it works. And Revault is really aimed at institutions. So, you, you know, you, you have to kind of squint at it and imagine how it would scale down. But I think um, between that and the paper that James wrote about Op Vault. If you read those, I think it, it kind of plants a good seed in the back of your head to start thinking about what vaults are, how they're useful, and, and how that could go forward. So if you're interested in that, I would, I would definitely look at those two things. Thank you. Uh, ben? Yeah, I just want to say, like, 
I think op vaults or any sort of uh, covenant proposal, like should we need this eventually in Bitcoin? And um, we have some really good proposals on it right now, and you know we should probably decide on one in the next few years and try to activate it. And like this isn't going to be a whole re-architecture like we did with Taproot or Segwit, having to like as Coinbase add you know support the setting to this. This to be super minimal and like a much smaller change set, so it's not as risky or anything like that. So I hope people can understand that. And, hopefully work on activating it. Great. Uh, James? I can say it better than those two guys just did. So thanks for bringing us on, man. If anybody wants to find the op vault paper, you can just go to my Twitter at James OB. It's linked right Show there. It. Like seriously, like tell people exactly where to find the stuff and where to read and like what should they should look into it. Like people don't know. And what should we add to the show notes? Sure. Yeah. So um, you can access the paper just by going to jameso.be slash vaults.pdf. So that's the paper I wrote. I think it gives a pretty good summary of prior work, kind of a setup for the problem. Um, and then the actual, uh, you know, design itself with some nice diagrams in there that, that kind of make some of the benefits clear. Then if you want to dive even deeper, there is a full implementation of it. Um, there's a pull request open in, uh, in the Bitcoin core repository. Embarrassingly, I don't know the number because I never remember those things, but it's there. It's got a lot of functional tests, so you can kind of get a really good sense of what it looks like, how it works, uh, what the transaction structure looks like. Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm working on a BIP. I'm really hoping to have kind of a final draft that I can circulate within the next week or so after I get a little bit of feedback from people. And then, um, yeah, beyond that, I think just, you know, if you have any questions, hit me up on Twitter at, at James OB and uh, we can talk about it. Uh, just for the record, I mean, James is one of the friendliest uh, people around with one of the biggest galaxy brains that's completely hidden in that, that pretty <laughs> face. So uh, do reach out to him and, and like I'm certain that he will politely explain things and and try to convey to you without pushing and, and like you know really like if you can't understand this stuff because really nobody can you know reach out to people and, and try uh because it, it is worth it we want a bitcoin future where people don't get robbed or lose their coins you're too kind man um yeah absolutely uh thanks for having us on and, and it was a really great discussion awesome guys thank you so much ben i'll see you in the kitchen in like five minutes <laughs> yeah, <I'll see> you. <laughs> thanks see you guys take care see you guys Thanks for listening. If you're new to the pod, make sure to listen to some very cool other episodes. Episode 15 about Lightning, episode 11 about podcasting 2.0 and value for value. And we also had a hardware wallet security panel on episode 5. Don't forget to follow at Bitcoin Review HQ or get in touch on Telegram, Bitcoin Review Pod, or Bitcoin Review at CoinKite.com. We don't have a crystal ball, so let us know about your projects. Leave your boostagram on this episode and we'll try to read it on the next episode. We've added more people to the splits. Now, if you send us streaming sets, some of that go to opensats.org and also to Citadel Dispatch with my guest, Odell. If you don't know much about Value for Value or Bitcoin Podcast 2.0, go to bitcoin.review slash v4v. Mm.